The Buddha, after his awakening, saw that the best use of his knowledge would be to teach the rest of the world how to understand suffering and how to put an end to it. There are so many things that he had learned in the course of his awakening, but this he realized was what the world needed most. When we think about wanting to help the world, we should keep that thought in mind. Putting it into suffering is a skill. And if we want other people to master that skill, we have to learn how to master it ourselves first. That we, we can give good advice, we can be a good example. This is what we can best contribute to the world. So after we've learned the Buddhist teachings about these things, how do we master that skill? We use our powers of observation. As you said, the Dharma grows by committing yourself to it and then reflecting. You do it. You follow the path. You take on his duties, the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths, the duties with regard to right effort. And then you watch yourself in action. And you figure out what's working, what's not. You learn how to understand causes and effects. And the more you bring your powers of observation to this, the more you're contributing both to your own well-being and the well-being of others. We don't think much about that connection, your powers of observation and how they are a contribution. But it's important. Because the Buddha sets out the main outlines of the practice, but there are a lot of things he doesn't explain. It's for us to see the relationship between causes and effects. This is what Aristotle defined as intelligence. Seeing connections in places where they haven't been pointed out been pointed out to you. And testing them then to make sure that they're really reliable. That goes beyond simple intelligence to integrity, reliability. And the primary things you're going to be watching are your own actions and their results. Sometimes we're told we should be very alert to how things arise and pass away momentarily. That somehow seeing them coming and going, coming and going, we get a sense of dismay over them, sense of dispassion, and then just basically want to drop them. But there are a lot of things out there that you see them coming and going, and it doesn't really make that much of a difference in the mind. There are other areas where they're coming and going. If you keep focused on it without having a good, solid basis inside the mind, it can get very disorienting. But there are some insight meditation practices that aim at that and that get you disoriented. You focus on things arising with away, passing away, arising and passing away, and you have no place to go. And so the mind shuts down. And then they say that's a state of awakening. Well, it's just the mind shutting down in a state of non-perception. Not much insight. Very quiet. In fact, no insight at all. But that's not what we're after. We're looking for something that will open up to the deathless, and that is something very, very different. And it depends on looking at where you are looking for your happiness, giving yourself a good state of mind to base your investigation on looking at all the things that would destroy that state of mind, and then looking within that state of mind to see where it's unreliable. Then you go from there to deeper, deeper, deeper states of concentration, more and more solid. And 
you know, approaching the concentration of the right attitude does require that you pay attention to details. This is one of the reasons why in the forest tradition so much emphasis is placed on your relationship to the teacher. I know in my own case, my relationship with the John Fuang was pretty intense. I was his attendant for six years, which meant that I was boiling the water for his bath, washing his clothes, looking after him when he was sick, cleaning up his hut, and I had to be very observant how things should be done, how he wanted them to be done, when he wanted them to be done. And he didn't always give the signals. Or if there were signals, they were very subtle, and I had to watch for them. And I wasn't sure I had to figure out what would be the best option. It requires a combination of being observant and also being willing to take a few risks so that you can learn. There are other cases where he would have people try to be very detailed in their meditation. He had one student who tended to have lots and lots of visions. So he told her one time, next time you have a vision of yourself, think of taking all the hair off your head and then replanting it. So she sat and meditated. Five minutes later, she said, okay, done. He said, what do you mean, done? Take it out in handfuls, okay, but now replant it one hair at a time. The purpose of that was to teach her to be meticulous, to watch her own mind. Because this reflective nature of the watching is important. I've told you before about that letter that was written by a student in Singapore telling John Fuang about his practice while he was trying to go through the day, being aware of how inconstant, stressful, and not self everything was, as he watched TV, as he drove, as he worked. And he told me to write back and say, the problem is not with the TV or your work or things outside. The problem is with the part of the mind that's saying these things are stressful and constant, not self. Well, look at that, because that's the, where the source of the problem is. In other words, we're here to look for the Four Noble Truths, not so much the Three Characteristics. The Three Characteristics have their place within the duties of the Four Truths. But the Four Truths are about seeing cause and effect in your own mind and getting more and more sensitive to ways in which you are causing yourself stress that you really don't have to. So if you're going to observe things in detail, be especially careful to observe your own mind in detail, to watch its actions and see where it's adding unnecessary stress to what's going on. As you pursue this deeper and deeper, you'll see more and more clearly that you're doing a lot more in the present moment than you would have assumed. If you simply tell yourself, well, don't add anything to the present moment, there are a lot of things that you haven't seen yet that you're doing, that you're adding to the present moment. They continue to go on. It's only when you become more and more sensitive through getting the mind more and more still, more alert to little bits of disturbance in the mind and stronger as a result, so that when you discover things that you've been doing that you're really attached to, you're in a better position to let go and not feel threatened and not feel disoriented. I talked to a Vipassana teacher one time who asked me, what do you do with people who gain stream entry and find it to be disorienting? And my response is, well, I tell them it's not stream entry. Stream entry is grounding. Getting there may take some questioning of things you're holding on to, forcing yourself to let go of things that you hold too dearly. But if you do it rightly, based on good, strong concentration, you don't feel threatened, you don't feel disoriented. And when the time comes to question your concentration and take it apart, you come from a sense of solidity. So try to be observant of the details, especially the details of what you're doing, and 
hold that question in mind, where is the unnecessary stress? What am I doing to contribute to it? Those two questions, if you follow them through, will make a huge difference. They're essential to this skill. And as you pursue them, you find that they open things up more and more. so that you will benefit from it, and then you'll be in a position where you can benefit others as well. Offer them something that wasn't there before, because your powers of observation are your contribution, something totally from within. If you want to give to the world, give it your powers of observation trained by the Buddha, trained by his questions. So like him, you'll be in a position to really help other people master this skill as well.